You come forward and do our own ritual, please. Before we get into the ritual, in praise of African God, in the tradition of our ancestors, and in celebration of our history. The First World Alliance invites you to share in our opening ritual. To honor our elders, would those Africans over 60 years of age please stand? To honor our children, with those with the youngest African child in the house, please stand or be held up. Yeah. All right. <laughs> to honor <clears throat> African life itself, with those sisters who are carrying a child in their womb, please stand. Don't tell me we had a problem with not building a family. Uh, don't be embarrassed now. Brothers and sisters, we will, we will, we will African life. <laughs> but I tell you something. We are going to have to continue to build a nation yes. because our warriors are leaving us at a very early age and we must continue to replenish, you know, the nation. Brother Sam. Thank you, Sister Kappa. Since we are running a little bit late, we're going to go right into the lecture. Uh, today, our speaker will be speaking on race, caste, and color in the Caribbean. And I will bring to you at this time Dr. Edward Scobie from City College. Dr. Scobie. Brother Sam. I was expecting something a little longer than that, but <laughs> <laughs> I was just about to read through some of the notes that I made. But before I begin, I'd like to say that I am always honored and happy to be here. If we think about it, I really never leave here because I know like you, I take away part of this afternoon with me. And I know, like you too, it carries me all throughout the week when I come back again for some more. And I'm always happy too to see Dr. Anderson because it makes me feel, it makes me feel that I shall never, never give up this struggle. The strength he gives us. It is not only Dr. Anderson, but this afternoon when I was sitting at the corner trying to disappear in the carpet, Dr. John Henry Cock came around. And he said to me, I'm here. And I said, I hope, I'm glad to see you because I'm going to need you to prop me up. <laughs> About Dr. Ben, 
what can I say except speaking after Dr. Ben, I really, really feel like going into the carpet, you know, after him last week. And Dr. Ben, whenever I hear him, Dr. Clark, I listen very intently. And as I was saying to most of my friends, whom I know very well, I'm glad to see them because I would much prefer to be in their place today than in mine. And um, I'm going to try my best to not hide in the carpet after this tour. Now, let us start. Now, first of all, our terms of reference in discussing race and color must be changed if we are to make fundamental alterations in our thinking when talking about race and color. Let me explain what I mean. Take the oft used word non-white. Now, if black at one end of the color spectrum signifies the fullness of color, then white at the other end must obviously mean the emptiness of color. So when we say non-white, we are in fact saying non-nothing. <laughs> no, we must not refer to three quarters of this planet's people as non-nothings. They are black, they are Africans, they are Asians. In any case, white is not a color. It denotes a lack of color, an emptiness of color. So it is in this frame that I want us to look into the question of race, class, and color in the Caribbean. I want to show you how and why African peoples of the Caribbean have gone through this steady, negative process of emptying themselves of color. This in itself is a tragedy because as our beautiful sister, Dr. Joyce Cress Welsing in her pioneering work, The Cress Theory of Color Confrontation and Racism Observes, she says these words which I want to impinge on your mind. The quality of whiteness is indeed a genetic inadequacy or a relative genetic deficiency state or disease <laughs> based upon the genetic inability to produce the skin pigments of melanin, which are responsible for all skin coloration. The massive majority of the world's people are not so afflicted suggesting that the state of color is the norm for human beings and that the state of absence is abnormal. And we know who will have that state of absence. That is why those with the color inadequacy start to peel off their clothes at the first peep of the sun held in the buds and bloom of springtime. Amen. Those who peel off are in search of color. Yes, and we know who they are. Even in the winter time, they cannot stand this inadequacy of color. That is why they fly south to the islands, yes. like the birds <clears throat> chasing after the sun, after heat, after color, after light, that is, after the Beach Boys of Barbados. <laughs> 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 
And to reinforce this condition, this quest for color, our beautiful sister and black scholar of penetrating intellect who is here with us this afternoon, Dr. Shasi McIntyre, in her important study, The Roots of Black Color Schizophrenia, uses a quotation from Dr. Ewan Block, <laughs> The Sexual Life of a Man, in which he states, white men from very early times have had a peculiar weakness for negresses and mulatto girls and women. The European newspapers are full of interesting reports of the powerful, attractive force exercised by exotic individuals, male and female, such as Negroes, Arabs, Abyssinians, Moors, Indians, Japanese, etc. Could have saved him by just saying Africans, <laughs> upon European men and women, respectively. It was this lack of color, this inadequacy, which forced him to gravitate towards color like a moth to firelight. This built in him a sense of inferiority, a jealousy, a hatred for those with the fullness of color. To mask this inferiority, he turned to violence, yes, to oppression, to racism, all products of his peculiar Caucasoid posture of race supremacy. And to maintain this false condition, he set about manufacturing a machinery, a system built on his own legal system and brute force to hold on to his race supremacy posture. It is this reprehensible, inhuman, inhumane habit that he has spread like an incurable disease. In all parts of the world, he has claimed by gun or his god, for his king, for himself, for his country, situated in the frost-bitten woods of Europe. And one area that has suffered intense disintegration and divisiveness as a result of this corporate behavior is the Caribbean. And it is with this frame of reference that I want you to understand race, class, color in the Caribbean. To do that, he had to manufacture a plantation society. It caused the denial of color or a color phobia. It caused the scramble for class. It caused the cult of whiteness. And it also brought about the divisiveness of the colonial ethic. All these conditions have been nurtured in the sun of the Caribbean. And the people to whom this has fallen upon and has clouded and confused and has scrambled their minds are those who had to remain in the Caribbean. The Europeans never looked at the Caribbean as home. Home for them was always some little nook and cranny in Europe, as miserable as it may be. Those who had to remain were the captives, the African captives, I don't want to use the word slave, who were taken and brought there. And to live within the confines on every single island of a plantation, hemmed in, was in fact to ask that something was going to happen to whatever tradition or whatever culture they may have taken from Africa. Because, remember, they did not have the guns. They did not have the whips. They did not have the chains. They did not have the hound dogs. Those who carried authority had all of that. And they made sure that they were going to keep this position, impose this will, impose this ideology, right is right, 
or to use Dr. J's famous phrase, the rightness of whiteness, they were going to make sure that they would use it in every conceivable way possible. And if we look, if we use this sort of pyramid structure, and we look at the Caribbean, what we're going to see, we are going to see that on any plantation that you choose to take, whether it's in Barbados, whether it is in Puerto Rico, or whether it is in Trinidad, or whether it is in Haiti, or Guadeloupe, or Martinique, wherever you choose to look, the system was the same. The atmosphere was the same. There may have been variations on the plantation, but a plantation is a plantation is a plantation. There is no good plantation and no bad plantation. All of them are terrible plantations. And so, when you think about it, you must realize this question I said of brute force, bringing to bear brute force so that they could acquire and make of them, of the Caribbean, the society they wanted. They spread it on every island between the 17th and the 18th century, when sugar was king or queen or princess, whatever it is. And um, they spread this, and what was created to begin with initially was a three-tiered structure in which we saw masters, three lakhs, and slaves. This was a beginning. But in between those, there were many castes and gradations. There was lateral movement, but at the same time, everyone was trying a kind of upward movement because even at that stage, the lowest one on the dung heap was the slave that worked in the field. In fact, the European was so perverse, he still is, that he chose to make it a badge of honor for an African to work in the big house. You know, you could get the cast off clothes and the crumbs that fell off masters and mamas and mistresses at the table. And so it was that even at the level of our brothers and sisters in the field, they were punished if they were working in the house by being sent back in the field because that was the lowest common denominator on the plantation. And so, as you can very well imagine, the higher up, the further away you got from the field and the sun on your back, is the less blows you would get and the less misery you would see. Because then if you were in the house, you felt that you stood a chance of escaping these miseries. There were miseries, but you felt at least they said the house was better. And so it was, it was a natural thing for our slave ancestors, our African captured ancestors, to want to gravitate into the house. But then if you looked further, you saw for yourself that if you were a free black, again, you had certain privileges. But again, privileges within that very close structure. A very, very close structure that gave you not the kind of limits that even the poorest and the more ab most abject European would have on the plantation. So naturally, you felt again a class, a step higher up than your brother who may have been working in the field or who perhaps was a better man than you. But however, you felt better than him because of what this manufactured society had made you. And let us not forget it. The society in the Caribbean for all the love that I have for the Caribbean as a place of part of my, my birth, a part of my tradition, the Caribbean, the society there, plain and simply is a manufactured society. It was a society where sugar was the dominant, dominant thing. And everything gravitated, revolved around sugar. And the more, and the more sugar that was produced, the more wealth 
was produced. And again, wealth not for those who had to do the labor. Wealth to build countries across the seas, for people across the seas. We must be very, very careful about that. And the only hand, again, again, I say this, but they knew very well that in creating and manufacturing this society to manufacture sugar, they had to have certain of their hypocritical values, so certain of their rather low values in order to make it work. And one of the lowest things that they always resort to, especially in their relationship with black, with African, is the use of force. That is why I said before, and I know Dr. Ben always says it, he says it with sarcasm and he's right, and Dr. Dr. Clark says it, is that their democracy stinks. <laughs> they may not use those words, but that's about the only thing to describe the democracy. Because if the laws that were made then to manufacture and produce an unreal society, because the society was unreal, none of the values we had with them, the values that we had, we took with us, none of these values were utilized on the plantation for our benefit. We lives, we live a shit soil life, on the one hand, we presented something that we were really not when we left them and we were left to our own devices in this very short hours that we had. At night time, we then lived our real lives. And so, this we took along throughout the centuries with us. A real life and an unreal life. And the Caribbean has been structured in this fashion. Up to today, Caribbean men of a certain quote-unquote class, Caribbean women of a certain quote-unquote class, behave and posture in two different ways. When the man is around, they are simpering imitators, carbon copies, poor ones of Europe. <laughs> and when he's not there, they let their African hair down and behave as they should behave. <laughs> this is one of the evils that we still have with us, and the roots were right there on the plantation. I'm saying again, there is another kind of thing that we have to deal with on the plantation. This question of sex on the plantation it was this very idea of sex on the plantation that turned a new kind of being in the Caribbean. A new kind, a new shade of color. A new word was phrased, was framed, was made. Mulatto. And this mulatto has a long, wide-ranging list that describes shades and nuances of color. Any of you who have any links at all in the Spanish countries in the Caribbean, or even in the French countries, the Dutch, the English, none of them, none of them, they all have varying phrases to describe this question of shades of color. This cohabiting of white and black and let me say to you that the cohabiting of white on black on the plantation did not begin with the African male. It did not. It began with a perverted, lurid European white. And who should fall victim to that? Our beautiful sisters and mothers and friends and others on the plantation. These are the ones. That is why it's a common thing at, at what they call in the Caribbean peasant level to say that our mothers had it both ways. They faced not only the whip, they faced something else too. I don't know which is worse, but both are bad. And to have to face that, to have to be beaten with the whip, and at the same time, 
have the person who beat you, as they say in the Caribbean, get sex out of you. That is insult to injury. And it is they who knew the pain of bringing forth this child. And bringing forth this mulatto child. And the irony of it all, on the kind of machinery and structure of the plantation meant that this child was going to turn away from his mother's womb, his black mother's womb, and ally himself and have allegiance to his European father's penis. His loyalty was not with his mother, excuse the word. His loyalty was with his mother, not with his mother, but with his father. That is what this kind of perverse machinery on the plantation did to the child. Because he wanted to grow to the top. And indeed, and indeed, laws were passed. Laws were passed giving a certain measure of authority, legal authority to mulattoes over blacks. So you can see again this kind of divisiveness that's being divided. Even among ourselves, this disloyalty was being spread. And it was done deliberately because that is one of the ethics of colonialism, to divide and, 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 and rule. Even in Haiti, in 1799, there was a British observer there, and he was to act as an intermediary between Toussaint Louverture and André Rigo, the mulatto leader. And you know what he spent his time doing? He said it himself, a man called John Wigglesworth. He said it. He said, I'm going to keep both at enmity with each other, never letting one get an ascendancy over the other. That way, we will keep Haiti under control. But that fool did not succeed because Haiti got out of his, their hands, the hands of France. But that is the ethic, divide and rule. And they did it on the plantation beautifully. And they did it with those who had to remain there. They passed laws. Even after a certain time, the third generation, a mulatto child or a light-skinned child was accepted as right. Doesn't it make a crime out of everything that is made right by the laws of these perverted people? Laws they made for themselves. That is why I always holler and scream in the Caribbean. Don't tell me about the laws. Unfortunately, my father was a lawyer. I say unfortunately. My grandfather was a lawyer. That is why I ran away from the law. And I didn't... <laughs> because I could see what used to happen and um, I had no confidence in the law. I used to say their law was made, their law was made to protect them. It wasn't made to protect us. We have to have a whole new, we don't have to revise it. We have to have a whole new set of laws that address themselves to our case. It was well described by a writer of the kind of society that I'm telling you about in Jamaica, even as early as the 17th and indeed the 18th century. This is how he described it. I took it down somewhere and he describes the society that he found, or uh, the Mulatto society, or the different shades in the Mulatto society, if I can find it. But he's talking about there are mulatto, mestizo, there's quad, there's octoroon, there's all kinds of rules going in that society. Each one describing, describing a shade of color. Yes, he says here, this man, John Stewart, he's describing the inhabitants of Jamaica during the 18th century. And this is how, very accurately that is, he describes, he describes the population. He says, between the whites, and the blacks in the West Indies, a numerous race has sprung up, which goes to the general name of people of color. I didn't know that was a race. <laughs> they are subdivided into mulattoes, the offspring of a white and a black, sambos, the offspring of a black and a mulatto, quadrilles, the offspring of a mulatto and a white, and nesties or mestitos the offspring of a quadroon and a white. Below this last denomination, the distinction of color is hardly perceptible. 
and those who are thus removed from the original Negro stock are considered by the law as white and competent, of course, to enjoy all the privileges of a white. Between this particular class, an endless variety of nondescript shades exist, descending from the deep jet to the faintest tinge of olive, by gradations which it were impossible to mark and to designate. You see the kind of confusion of these people came over there and set about producing a confusion of color. Now, it was all well and good to say that. On the plantation itself, we know that once you were at the very top, once you were, you were what the Haitians called the gold lance, then you exercised exercise total authority. And when you had a lesser group of whites beneath you, who were bookkeepers, shopkeepers, overseers, what have you, soldiers, merchantmen, traders, they all aspired to the tip of the pyramid. Because that is where all the authority lay. And those who were right down in the dungeons of the field, of the, of the pyramid, could look up and see, well, if I get to the top, I am going to have that authority. And the way to get to the top is by the whiteness of color. In other words, empty myself of color to get to the top. And this is still thought of today in the Caribbean. If you go to some places, it's only to do it. Because they have a very aggressive, radical, young group of our brothers and sisters. Some of them are misguided with their Marxism, but I'll come to that at a, at a little later date. But a lot of them are no believers in the colonial ethic. And they know very well that those who are there now in their two-party Westminster-type government are merely puppets right. operating, manipulating, and moving when Reagan says move. <laughs> because the Caribbean, as you well know today, is still very valuable yes, for strategic reasons, for other reasons, to the United States of America. And Britain have been sucked to dry and gone away. America feels that I'm the big whip and they're going to take it over. But then, you know, lucky that there are those who don't hold that kind of view. And they are getting more and more in numbers. And those who hold the old colonial view, fortunately or unfortunately, are dying. And so, yeah, well, perhaps there will be a new Caribbean. But in the meantime, what I want to say to you, if you go to any of the Caribbean islands, apart from the fact I know some of you um, originally saw the light of day there, but when you go there, you still find how in, where in advance you are of your brother or your sister in thinking about race, in thinking about Africa, in thinking about yourself. You know, there's some people who are horrified when they hear you talk about the ordinary things we say right here about Africa, things that we know that are true. And the reply that I get sometimes, oh, you crazy man. <laughs> brother tells me that. I tell him as a boy, I used to weep for you. I still weep for you. But you will learn one day if I have my hand in it, you will learn. But it's true, you go into a bank. And if you watch the bank, sometimes I have to go in there, I usually have to deal with unpaid bouncing checks and so. So I go into the bank. And when I get into the bank, I see a long line of people like myself there. Some of them dressed really without shoes and rather shabbily because they come there with their little money. They want to have a little account, their little savings account, that they sold their dashings and their yam and their tanya 
and they want to put them there to maybe buy a little, some of them even want to buy television sets, in the, even in the, in the woods of Dominica and elsewhere. America is poking his nose in everybody's drawing room these days, <laughs> unfortunately. And so they stand in line, and those lines on market day are as long as the Nile. They are long, those lines. <laughs> and they wind in and out of the, 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 the building and outside on the sidewalk going round the bend. And they stand up there. And two or three tourists, their skin burnt the color of lobsters, come in. <laughs> they come in in their shorts or whatever they wear. Sometimes they wear precious little. And they walk in and the local quote-unquote whites who are not really white who are victims of just what I'm saying, <clears throat> stand on the side. And the bank manager, who is a black bank manager, says, Oh, hi, Tom. Man, Tom, I wanted to tell you this. Come here. And Tom, he has nothing to tell Tom. You know, that's a means of making Tom come at the back. And he'll take the check and give it to a girl. And Tom will get it and walk out with a smug smile on his stupid face. <laughs> Tourists come there and get looked at, attended to by the very girls, our black, our sisters that are there. And they will attend, and you want to hear the way they treat people who come there and do business with them all the time and have accounts there, the, what we call at home, the peasant people, people of the soil of the earth that really matter. These are the ones that keep life going in the Caribbean, and they're the ones that get the dirty end of the stick. Right. So this thing is still there, and no government, no government constituted as it is today can remove that. It's impossible. It is the will of the people that is going to remove it. <laughs> On the Caribbean plantations, all the laws, all the habits, all the customs were formed by them. If whatever African beliefs or retentions, or survivals that we had had to be practiced away from them so that they would not see. And there was, it was done with a certain amount of subterfuge so it could last. So in a way, what has happened is that they have taken all our retentions from Africa. For instance, today, you couldn't, unless it was a carnival time, unless you were putting on, the government was putting on a show from a, from a group of hoteliers from Texas or something like that, they would get the girls to perform the limbo dance. You know what the limbo is like. They would get them to perform the limbo, or they would want them to do the shango, or one of the dances, you know, or the makumba, or any of the dances they wanted, or the belle. These were African exoticisms. Well, they are not. They're part of our African tradition. And the government does nothing to present them as such. There's exoticism. Even in the religion of Buddha, any of the religions that are practiced out there, they are looked upon even in a place like Brazil as sorcery, witchcraft, and the laws against them. This is what they have done. And yet, you know, they say, Oh, these are for the poor people, these are for the uneducated people, these are not for the middle class. I do not know what a middle class is, you know. I wish somebody would, uh, would tell me, at my age it's about time I knew, but I'm, I suppose I'll never know. Because there's no such thing as middle class with us blacks. No such thing. They take these retention, these beliefs, and they are discarded. But what is official, what is the good grace and the blessing of their God Almighty when you whichever heaven he may be, whether the heaven of the White House or the heaven of Buckingham Palace, where he usually resides because that's where all the goods are, all the money is. And so, Roman Catholicism, Protestantism, Methodism, all the Orthodox churches of European Christianity are respectable, 
God-fearing and should be practiced by all, decent citizens, poor or not poor. But if you try anything, they will say to you that that is sorcery, that is obeah. And yet, one of the things that the mulattoes or the upper classes or the middle classes, to use Caribbean connotation, one of the things that they can never get away from is the biggest practitioners in Bodu and others are these mulatto middle class ones. You go and you find them, they always want people, they always try to get people to what they say in the Caribbean, to cut cards for them. To, as they say, if there's any Haitian friend here, look, to gade by you. You know what gade means, to look for them, you know, that kind of thing. And so I say, this is the society that was bred. Men and women who came out of the plantation, who came through the most pernicious ways of sex, these men and women were the ones who, when slavery as an institution was dismantled, they were the ones that found themselves in positions where they could command, command a position, a sort of block between the masses and the white plantocracy or the white colonial power. They were put there for that reason. They were the ones that first got the classical European education. Because to educate yourself in those days, you had to have money to go to even a miserable grammar school. You had to have money. You got a kind of education, a kind of education, when you just about learned how to read and write and how to spell, not too many big words, but little words. And then you were fit then to be a domestic servant, to work on the roads, to dig ditches, to break macadam, and to, to fix roads and bridges, and to be a porter on the wharf. That was about what you were taught. But when the few that moved into the secondary education, it was obvious that they had a role to perform. And that role they were going to perform, they were going to keep the population steady, to keep it stable, so that it could be exploited by Europe forever. And that was where their loyalty became. There were men and women who did learn and who could absorb the three hours of Europe. These were men who could speak Latin, and these were men who bragged that even when they were drunk, they could recite Shakespeare. And that's a common thing in the Caribbean with men drinking. When they get drunk, they start to recite Shakespeare, you know. <laughs> and they could brag about that. But their loyalties were always, their eyes and their loyalties were always towards England, that miserable little island on the shores of Europe. That is where their eyes were always. And it is so. When, in fact, they got holidays, you know, after you work in the civil service over there for a certain length of time, you get six months leave after three years. Well, that was meant for white colonials, so they could go back to Surrey and see how they kicked black people up and all over the place. And some of them did do it. So they could go back and see how the blacks were lazy, they didn't want to work, and they had to be beaten to work, and, you know. And that was for that purpose, for the whites to go there. But I know people in the Caribbean, blacks, like any of us here, that when they had their, th their three-year service in the colonial civil service, and they were getting their six months leave, they used to say they were going home. And don't ask me where home was. Because home, they did not mean Africa. I know one, he's still alive, he's called Ashilullah, Pernod. We went to school together. And he's very, very light of color. Tall, very light of color. But he was, they used to make, they used to try, when he was a student at the grammar school, he tried to make bombs, homemade bombs. 
and one ex uh, some of them exploded and burned his face. And when he was finished, after he came out of hospital, I said, Ashil, you must be glad, because it has made you whiter. <laughs> it did. It did. His face got white. <laughs> so now you know how to do it. <laughs> But he was going to Scotland to look for his great grandfather. I said, Ashil, you know, you are a legitimate son of nobody. But you have a beautiful mother. Stay and look after her. But that is the trend. That is the kind of thing that happens. Even today, we have our intellectuals from the most radical universities. If they have not been to London saying that he wants to go to Accra, he wants to go to Lagos, or he wants to go to Egypt, he wants to go to London. <laughs> or Paris, if he has a nasty mind, which he usually does. <laughs> And this is the kind of thing that a colonial manufactured society has done to us in the Caribbean. These men who are really were educated because they were the ones that filled in the places when Europe, they, they ran the Europeans out of the Caribbean. They filled in those places. And you would think that they would make a change. There was no change at all. It was business as usual. The only thing is that the color was slightly different. But underneath all the slight differences of color, the overriding color was the emptiness of white was still there. For instance, the two-party form of government is still there. In a small island like Dominica, in a small island like Nevis, in a small island like Antigua, you name them, they're literally up and down that little arc and their little arched backbone in the Caribbean. You tell me that each one is an independent unit. Independence is a fine thing, but that's not the end of the line. The end of the line must mean that we have to get together and within us, work out a kind of African Federation in the Caribbean. <laughs> None that will work. What happens is that we have a two-part... There is no political ideology because the ideology of the British Labour Party and the British... Conservative Party, there are no difference at all. And to say that you are a Dominica Labour Party and the Dominica Freedom Party is like saying that you belong to no party at all. And we carry on this charade in the Caribbean. There is no ideology because the ideology must come from within. The only kind of direction that one can see out of the Caribbean is a curious mixture a curious mixture of the Rastafarian cult together with a kind of Marxism. And even so, Dr. Ben has gone into that, and I know Dr. Clark has gone into that. We try to tell them in the Caribbean that Marxism and communism never addressed itself to racism. Communism will never address itself to racism. Because I know for a fact, I have been to Czechoslovakia many times, I have been to Hungary, and I have some friends who were in Hungary who went to do medicine, some Ghanaian friends who went, were in Budapest, and there were lots of Guyanese brothers and Ghanaian brothers and Nigerian brothers going to the university there. And the time that I was, I used to go to Philly after a couple of brothers that I knew very well. And one of the things, one summer, there was a riot that I was involved in it. And you know why? The 
students, the Budapest students, hated the Africans because they are simpering, colorless women who run after these African brothers. And when I tell you run, that I mean run. <laughs> I am a little mature now. I shouldn't fall back into it. <laughs> and I say to you, it's the same thing. A brother, friend of mine, who was in, he was very friendly. He went to the University of Moscow for a while. And he was there as a, you know, as a sort of artist in residence. And he came out and wrote a book, Professor Jan Karu. I know Dr. Ben knows him and Dr. Clark and some of you here may know him. And the book was Moscow is not my Mecca. That was the title of the book. You know, the, the Russians made a big fuss and when they read the book, they hated his guts. And, um, and he exposed the fact of racism in Moscow University. So you Marxists in here tonight, beware. Beware, brother, beware. You know, I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. You don't even have to look at them. Dr. Clark has told you so. Dr. Ben has told you so. You know who found out you don't have to look at, at their Marxism? And their C.L.R. James. Kwame yeah, right. Nkrumah. George Padmore. Yeah. These are some of our leaders who found out. Yeah. That is not for us. Pan-Africanism is for us. And the struggle in the Caribbean is a serious one. Although they're not sort of living in the belly of the beast like we over here are. And perhaps it would have been better if they had been living in the belly of the beast. It would have removed all that stupidness about color and shade of color. Because black is black and white is white. But that is not the case in the Caribbean. And they're having a hard time to remove that out of their mind. And not only at the educational level, but it was a thing in my time and still today where you had, I can remember mothers saying to their daughters, don't go back to Africa. There was Marcus Garvey in the Caribbean who was trying to show us the way. The mulattoes and the middle class of Jamaica and the rest of the Caribbean drove him out and sent him to America. And a very good thing too. Even when he came back there, or when they were sending him back there in handcuffs for something that he never did. Even at that time, Jamaica would not have him. They said, we do. If you read the old copies of the Gleaner today, you would never believe, you would believe it was a white paper, a white Ku Klux Klan paper. We are ashamed of Garvey. No country in the world should have this man. Not even Africa wants him. But Africa would want him. Africa would want him. And Africa has wanted him. Like we here out of Africa wanted him and showed that we wanted him. But again, time changes even the minds of fools. Even the minds of idiots and those who cannot see. With the result that God remains had to be taken back to Jamaica. And now he is one of the sons of honor in Jamaica, as he should have been. Yeah. <laughs> but they had men like men who were saying the same thing Garvey was saying. There was not only Garvey, they had been blinded. There had been George Padmore, and I can remember well, because as I said, I was fortunate to have known and met Padmore and gone to his house many times in North London when I was much younger than, than, than I am now. And one of the things I can remember, when Eric Williams, the great doctor Eric Williams, who wrote the classic Capitalism and Slavery, and he said in Capitalism and Slavery that it was not the color of the skin that was important. It was the economy of sugar that really dictated the sugar industry in the, in the, slave, the slave trade and slavery. He was wrong. You know why? It was precisely color 
the fact that the fullness of color, the fullness of black, could make Africans withstand the kind of rigors that they had in the Caribbean. That is what, that is why they took Africans, because we could withstand it. They were dying like flies. The same thing happened in Virginia, in, in, in the swamps of Virginia. They couldn't stand it. Obviously because they have a lack of color, an emptiness of color, so they can't stand it. But we can stand it. That was what, that was what decided that they were going to use Africans. And then make big excuses that they were heathen, blah, 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 and all that other rubbish. But I'm saying, even Williams, a man of that scholarship, and a man who did have great scholarship, and a man who as a politician did, as he said, pull Trinidad up by his bootstring when he dropped his bucket there and decided I would stay there. But even he, he had a narrow focus. And you know, his focus was not a global one. That was his problem. His, his focus was not an African one. You know why? He said when C.L.R. James and John Moore and the others were in London, together with Nkrumah and the others, trying to fight colonialism, trying to free Africa, he turned around to C.L.R. James and said, I'm surprised at you. Why don't you come down a tree? Now that's where we need you in the Caribbean. Leave Africa for the Africans. C.L.R. told you, what the hell do you think you are? <laughs> And from that time on, the friendship was never the same with C.L.R. and Eric and, and Eric Williams. And the thing is, what did Williams do with Trinidad? Trinidad is a natural place. It's oil, it has oil, it has pitch, it has everything. It's a natural place. Eric Williams had every conceivable European com company come there and exploit the people. A brilliant scholar. That is why... He did some good, I must say he did some good. But every time he quoted something, even in his book, you read Capitalism and Slavery, and you know what you see? He quotes Aristotle. <laughs> he quotes Diana Siculus. He speaks of ancient Rome and Greece. And he talks about slavery and all He never gets down to Africa. Never does. That is why today, some of the young radicals in Trinidad and elsewhere call him. They say, Eric Williams was not only the author of capitalism and slavery, he was also the agent of capitalism and slavery. <laughs> I'm saying, when James and others were fighting to take away Africa from those people after the Berlin Conference that they part partitioned off every little bit for themselves, when CLR and others were engaged in that struggle, Williams was saying, this struggle is not an African struggle, come back. It's a Caribbean struggle. And there were many leaders in the Caribbean who never saw their struggle as an African struggle. It is today that the truth is being forced upon them. And I say forced upon them. Garvey spent his life doing it. Garvey, a product of Jamaica, spent his life. And today they can see it. They see it now. Thank our Christ, our God, that they have young people with the foresight to see that the struggle is not a Trinidad struggle, it's not a Jamaican struggle, it's an African struggle. In the meantime, in the meantime, while we have a set of people who are really struggling to remove this kind of vestiges of colonialism that still remain. They are fighting regimes. They are fighting regimes that are placed there pure, purely to keep the people right where they are. Have you noticed that Lord Tom Adams, the Prime Minister of Barbados, and um, Others, they never go into the Caribbean and meet together and decide, look, let us have a policy. We are going to get together. We are going to trade in the Caribbean. We are going to extend our arms to, to Africa. We are going to involve ourselves in a very direct way in the African struggle, in the African-American struggle. No. When Tom Adams comes here, he stays at the White House or he stays at the Hyatt, whatever they call that place downtown. That's where he stays. They never have summit meetings among themselves in the Caribbean. They must have a summit meeting 
in London. Like the oil cartel. Look where they were having this, the oil meeting in London. People who are undercutting them, who are lowering the price of oil and messing them up, they go and have it in London. They are still colonial in that thinking. I say, they look to the same traditional people. They look to the same people who exploited them for centuries. For centuries. Britain, France, Germany, Holland, Denmark. And they still do business with them. They would not think of doing business with each other. They would not think of doing business with Africa. They're open markets. The master says, no, you have to do business with me. And he gives you $13 million of the hard-earned tax that you pay. And what do you think happens? It doesn't benefit the island. It doesn't. They say it gives more people jobs. And it doesn't. You know that because every time you go to Kennedy Airport, a lot of our people are jumping off the plane and are going through immigration and having a rough time to come here to face the same hell that you and I are facing. Because there is nothing at all in the Caribbean as it is constituted now by its government that is going to change the lives of the people in any meaningful way. And to go on to say this is to explain to you something that I think needs explaining. This question I talked to you about, about color or the lack of it. And many poems have been written of this sort of clash of color or this um, pathology of color or lack of it. And it is something that has eaten itself into the psyche of the African Caribbean man and woman. And one poem that I have, I'd like to read to you because it epitomizes to a high point the summit or perhaps the depth that one can get in thinking or in trying to come to grips with this war and this clash of color identity. And it's a poem, not a long one, but it's a poem <coughs> that I said I would read to you. So that it's something, it was something that really applies to, to the, as they say, quote unquote, people of color. Blacks, Africans, but they say people of color. And this is a poem here called Two Voyages by a Caribbean poet. Two voyages I carry round with me, raging and billowing in the hurricane of a pimento-colored skin, which is my one-way passage to the Caribbean Sea. The first embarked from mother country ports, sauntering away from powdered elegance and Georgian ease to sting the whip across black backs, their faces milled in pain against the cross of tambourine trees. Many, many whiplashes ago, the second voyage saw birth with labor pain, manacled and herded along the coast of Sengar. Its cries still banshee forth across the middle passage seas, howling for freedom. In the face of one punched sides, their shades roam with alias sugar planting in the hades of Antillean groves. Through continents of thought, both voyages globe trotted in my mind. Times were when the siren winds of, of snobbery would blow from Little Britannia lands across the waves and drive me deep down into the pimento of my skin to shelter, but I never drowned myself. Other days, I rode the white sea horses thundering on colonial lands before me. There, I bandished the master's armory, chains, bibles, and powder of the gun. Conquering fetish, riding waves, flag planting all the way, but I always drowned myself. Came moments when I decided I had to make a choice. Which voyage must I take? Which one showed signs of calmer seas and lands ahead? Which one would lead me to the terra firma of myself? I tried to sail away from part of me I did not want, because it was a tribal mark from Senegal. All through the narrow-minded funnel of the years, I heard a voice within me saying, 
Don't chart your course to Africa. Fairer, fairer, your children must become. So marry right and purify your father's blood. This is a poem. This journey threw me into cross currents with myself that whirled me and made me lose control and flounder until I almost drowned myself. But many times, like flotsam, cast away by my mother's master race, I drifted. It was then my mind turned back to Sanga, calling for my father, who arrived with open arms, drowned by Africa's Caribbean sun. There was no need for him to chide, to scold, or preach, because he knew, at last, I'd found the telephone of myself in him. Yeah, Caribbean people have that kind, that kind of problem, especially our girls, in finding themselves. And it is to them, particularly, that this duty and this journey becomes oppressive and onerous. Because everything that was manufactured in the society came from Western soiled hands. And the things that the Western mind and the Western ideology played great importance on, on individualism, greed, materialism, sex perversion, and any other sin that you choose to mention in and out of the book. These are in the Caribbean roads just as much as they are anywhere. And that is why there is a friend, a Trinidad African friend, who wrote a book some years ago called Oh Loveless, a book he called Why Gods Are Falling. And in that book, what he does is he shows us a mirror, a picture of the kind of life in the Caribbean, I mean, in the 60s and 70s. And in fact, if any of you go back to the Caribbean now, you will see it's the kind of life that is still there. It is like nothing has changed, you know? When you stay on an island and you stand by the shore and you look, you see the horizon and you think that an island is a world and that everything that happens there is of the utmost importance. But there are some of us today, young ones, elders, who look on the shore of the Caribbean and look across and we are seeing the struggle. We are seeing Africa for the very, very first time. But in those days it wasn't so. Lovelace wrote this and he said, he gives you a picture, a social scene of the Caribbean in his book, When Wild Gods Are Falling. And he says this, and he's talking about a street, a street where boys and girls grow up. Normal, boys and girls are poor families, not so poor families, barefooted families, and they do have those in the Caribbean. And he says this, and it is something that is very, very important to understand. When you see anyone, any brother or any sister from the Caribbean, with his shade of color, or his lack of his shade of color, whatever it is, coming here. Because a good thing about it, when he comes here, it seems ironical. When he goes to London, it also seems ironical when he becomes African. And it is a good thing too. Because Lovelace says here, he's describing the kind of emptiness of life there. And it is empty. And he says this, failure, like a jagged edge knife, twists teeth into his chest. Frustration chases anger down the street of his mind. It is only left for him to weep. Weep for and his dream. Weep for one aging man has words and no deeds. And the mother is stiffened by pride and galled by previous failures. And young women are prostitutes before their breasts are fully formed. And young men are angry and violent. Angry at street corners, ready to stick a knife in God's ribs. And the mother prays, and her son knows that he must hope. 
And in this city, in this island, the gods are falling. And there is nothing for the young people to look up to. Nothing for anyone to look up to. The leading citizens are wrapped in their self-centeredness. And life is the extension of the individual's personality. A sort of emotional masturbation. And love is something that you can crease and slip into your wallet. And pride is something that on a Sunday morning you wash with a garden hose and shine, having polished. It is not only unemployment and shanty towns and overcrowded houses, not so much crimes of violence and sex. It is that there is nothing decent or valuable to hold on to. Out of the land has come asphalt and oil. From the bosom of the peasant, the bongo and the limbo have come, and the wealth of song. From the tesses, the calypso and the steel band. But out of the others, the leading citizens, the good and the rich and the educated, one has come. Nothing. This. This may seem an extreme description, but let me tell you, it is not extreme, because there is nothing to look up to. And it is only the young people who are realizing that the struggle has to come from inside, and we have to meet this struggle with the struggle of the brothers and sisters right here at the First Alliance. We have to do that, the First World Alliance. And with the struggle in Zimbabwe, in Tanzania, in London, in Liverpool, in Georgia. They realize that. And no amount, no amount of money from the World Bank, no amount of visits by the cowboy, <laughs> nothing will stop this change that is inevitable. And it is when this thing happens, it is when it happens that we here will say to ourselves, you know, that we as Africans really let us look around. We are on the march and nothing's going to stop us. And before, before I say au revoir for now, there are a few things that I like to add. There has been this gotten idea that the plantation where all of this thing started was a repository of culture. There was nothing of the sort. You don't use whips, you don't use guns, you don't use violence and dogs. Nothing is created in such an atmosphere. But when you are left to your own devices, like we were, our African ancestors, then we said, to hell with them, then we will create our own thing. And it is that we created. If you look at the Caribbean, there is nothing created in the Caribbean that has come from the middle classes. Nothing. They are only excellent, brilliant imitators. Imitators of what? Imitators of people who exhibit a monumental emptiness of color, Europeans. And you see, when we realize that, we realize that I know and you know we are on the right road, like young people in the Caribbean. As I said, there is no prison. There is no jail that can contain them or contain us. We will just keep on. And I know all of us here, I virtue of the fact, we have become here. We have a commitment. I know that. And I wish, when I moved to the Caribbean last year, I got a little more unpopular, I'm glad, <laughs> because the nuns made a mistake and ask me, the faithful virgins, I don't know what's faithful about them, they don't give anything, so I don't see how they, they can have anything to give. 
Well, you know, when you're a nun, you get nuns, you know. <laughs> it was the 150th anniversary of the Adeste Fidelis Convent in Dominica, where my mother went to, and my sister. But I'm sure my mother, wherever she is, her, her spirit was happy that at least for once in his life, her son redeemed himself and um, said the truth. The nuns didn't know where to look. They didn't know where to bow. As soon as I finished, I saw them kneeling and men breaking the sign of the cross. They were praying for me. And um, the priest took off. <laughs> but it served them right for asking me. <laughs> And to, and to leave you, I always like to leave something that I think, there's something that whenever I notice that something, I like to leave with it because I feel that it conveys the kind of message that we want to convey here and we want to spread as African brothers and sisters. And it's this, two things. I do not believe we should waste our time looking for help from our legal system. Nor do I have faith in politicians, scientists, or experts. I have great faith, however, in individual people, in my African brothers and sisters. Thank you very much. Thank you. of another stalwart brother. And of course, by virtue of an incident that took place at the latter part of last year, it drives me to ask Brother William X to come forward And equally, our elder and sage, the most honorable brother, John Henry Clark, to come forward. and wisely so. Place not flowers on my grave when I cannot smell them. <laughs> but whatever little you have for me, give me while my eyes can behold them, my hands can feel them, mm -hmm. my mouth can taste them, and of course, my senses can appreciate them. I will call upon for the X to do what he has to do. Good evening, brothers and sisters. My name is William X. Randolph of the Sons and Daughters of the Sun. Last week, February 26, we had our first annual African dance, and we presented awards to the Honorable Dr. Ben. Now the Professor Simmons and Honorable Bob, Bob Jackson. Dr. Clark was not present, and so we are going to hand him his plaque now. And it says, Sons and Daughters of the Sun presents to the Honorable Dr. John Henry Clark. And by the way, that term honorable is not given lightly. This award in grateful appreciation for his historical contributions to the African community, February 26, 1983.
There is also another matter. These young brothers and I think sisters understand that in order to speak one needs to be strong. And all money by itself is no evil. But in the hands of many, it is destruction. However, the brothers wanted to give a very little token in terms of money which we will not let you know their mouth. <laughs> to also help the clock celebrate this appreciation and thus this envelope. Thank you very much. I want to thank the brothers and sisters, and I want to also thank you because this is a spiritual home, an intellectual home, a cultural home for me, and that I found out that whatsoever cure that there is for me, it will be at home and not in a hospital. <laughs> I also want to say a token of respect for Professor Scobie and his subject. I have heard Michael Mandler say that Jamaica is the most stratified society in the world. But when they really could not conquer us perfectly, they split us up into different sects and put one against the other. That Caribbean island, those Caribbean islands need to be studied all over again because the entry of African people in the so-called New World started in those islands. The fight of African people to regain themselves started in those islands. Remember, we didn't arrive over here until, 15, until 1619. They had a slave revolt of African people in Cuba as 1530. And a slave revolt here in the United States, led by an African who was leading Irish indentured servants and black indentured servants, African indentured servants, as early as 1634. So we have to study the islands again. And we have to stop making a separation between an African people or an African people. <laughs> I will tell you a story that I probably have told you before, then I'll sit down. <laughs> I was at the home of a person who was entertaining some people from Australia. Not Australia, but New Guinea, by way of Australia. And the brother came across the room and shook my hand. Said, did you know I am a Negro just like you? And I said that, well, I don't use the word Negro. I prefer the word African. He said, it doesn't matter what word you prefer. I just want you to think, to know that I am your brother. And so some Englishman spoke up and said, I am not sure <laughs> that these people can be classified as Negroes. And I said, shut up. <laughs> I ain't talking to you. I said, this man has come from the far end of the world. He has identified himself as my brother. To you, I have nothing to say, but to him, I have one thing to say. Brother, take your brother's hand. of going to 
the motherland, and specifically the Nile Valley, has been lately to introduce something new each time we go. We will be introducing you to something new, especially those of you who have gone before. If you come again, there will be something new. And that's all I'm going to say about that something new. <laughs> so as stated before, we are leaving actually on the 31st of July. We are returning on the 14th of August. And we will have something new. For those who know, we will also have something as new which I will speak about now. It's a sad thing that we had to go to Korea and to Japan, Vietnam, to learn to defend ourselves. I thought that black folks in Harlem were very adequate in defending ourselves, even without the knife and the switchboard, switchblade. As many black folks have broke each other's legs and things before there was a Japanese here. <laughs> and as many barbarians have been showing how to use a stick, and of course, we are good at conchers and stones. <laughs> and like Red Fox said, that the young brother jumped up in front of him one day and says, bam, bam, and Red Fox said, what the hell is that? He says, karate. <laughs> and Red Fox did like this, bam, bam. And when the brother's guts was falling out, he said, what's that? And Red Fox said, Kareza. <laughs> before you have to suffer correct that this time I'm going to take you into the grandmas of Luxor and show you the whole outline of African defense system the martial arts if you want to call it of Africa I can tell you from now where we're located it's on the right hand side when we enter into the great hall by the colonnade you would see there no man learns everything in one day. <laughs> and so when we go back to Africa this time, to our motherland, we'll be introducing two aspects. And each time we go, we'll introduce two more, or more. And so I'm asking you, now last thing is, we're respecting a landslide. And the quicker you register, we may have to have two trips. But I'm asking you to make certain that you get on the right one. I'll be on the first one. <laughs> and so, we'll have later things to tell you about. And again, I want to pay tribute to Professor Scobie while I'm here, take opportunity as Professor Clark did, and say, at times we believe that probably, Professor Clark and myself, we discussed this in New York, we discussed this in Detroit, we discussed it all over the South. We have many occasions to be together traveling. And we were always discussing what happened when we died, since it's inevitable. How would it be going on? At one time, it seems as if there would be a total vacuum. I am sure that there will not be a total vacuum if we get more veins, we get more, um, Brother from Connecticut, brother. That was Turner, my boss. And brother that wrote, wrote, wrote um, Wait First. Brother Martin. And the late one, Jeffrey. <laughs> <laughs> and a number of others that look so good. Today we heard a Reverend Butts. We heard a new Reverend Butts today, at least. I think Sister Keffer would agree with me. If only he would be that Butts as he was today, we could have a good new person in black Christianity. We would have had to hear him to appreciate it. Unfortunately, we did not record it. But it was a new Reverend Butts today. I don't know what happened. Probably seen his Willie came back and grabbed his throat and directed it. 
<laughs> but we can add one more person. A person who gives you an accurate assessment of the Caribbeans from the tip of Florida to the shores of Venezuela. And I know that you will have more to tell us again, but I need say, as a member of the elders, although you may not be 60, Scobie, yeah. we would, yeah? yeah? Oh, then, uh, well, then I'm losing now. I thought he was one of them young with the snappers. <laughs> but it, it seems as if he has elder season. <laughs> <laughs> now, girls, since I'm not, you know, we've noted that today there was no pregnant women. And we have already given the brothers hell for that. <laughs> but sisters, you can't get pregnant saying no. Shasi McIntyre, whom I, was, I mentioned a while ago. And before I, I answer her, I'd like to say that about nine or ten years ago, I was placed in the same kind of straight jacket position at an African Heritage Studies Association panel. I was the moderator, the guy they were taking pot shots at, and Shasi had one of her brilliant papers which she presented on that panel. And it gave me a lot of problems at the time to know how to, what to say and how to deal with it. But I was so impressed, I mean, as anybody who had read it would be impressed, that um, I said, all right, I'm going to get back one on her. So I, got, I, made, I took her manuscript for her and made her autograph it for me, and I got it up to now. <laughs> there it is. She was on this panel. But um, to answer your question, Chelsea, in the Caribbean, there was, a, there was a family tree that emanated on the plantation. And curious enough, as you know, since the whole of the society was formed within that kind of periphery, um, one knew one's, the question of birth. It was not only the question of a mulatto born out of, a, say, a gobla or a white, it, but it was who he was, what kind of, of um, property he had, the size of the plantation, whether he came in from Paris, whether he was a comte or a vicomte or a marquis or something of like that, that placed him on a higher pedestal than say X who had a plantation lower down and his plantation was smaller and he had less slaves. It was a common thing that was said. I've, um, even during the time of indentured labor in the Caribbean and after, I can remember as a very young boy hearing my grandmother saying that um, um, on, uh, on 
her mother's, on her grandmother's plant, the plantation that her grandmother was on, that they had, it was, it was no little person, it was no little owner. The owner had been invited to Buckingham Palace, and so they were glad to have the children of that plantation owner. He was, a, he was a lord, he was a, a Mulgrave lord, one of the many Mulgraves that went to the Caribbean. But he, he, in fact, to have children from him, mulatto children out of him, was a bigger thing than to have mulatto children out of a mere, uh, a mere lawyer or a mere bookkeeper's clerk. And it is a funny thing that the very people who were, whose chastities and whose chastity and privacy was invaded by these men who had mulatto children. They were the first ones, even the slave women themselves, were the ones to feel proud that the, the offspring was from Lord Mulgrave sort of thing. You know, and they carried on. And the slaves had a, a, a kind of record, an unwritten record of the kind of family tree, and they placed an importance on that. And this is something that was carried on up until the 19th century, and the middle years of the 19th century, because I was reading my grandfather's um, notebooks. He kept copious notebooks and journals, and one of the titles of his journal was called, the, of, his, of a chapter in his journal was, The Mulatto Ascendancy. And some men who he, he, he was friendly with, and who had used to belong to the same club with him, and others that he had, quote unquote, white bald, they say black bald, but I say white bald, and prevented from joining these clubs. And then he would consider, you know, he would consider himself above them to the extent that when he walked down the street and he met them, he wouldn't say, good afternoon, Mr. Lockhart. Mr. Lockhart had to say good afternoon first. And if you were Mr. Lockett's child, you had to say good afternoon to his child first. And so it went on. And Mr. Lockett's slave had to say good afternoon to his slave. And it went on, it was an unholy long line, a mess. And this was carried on. And Caribbean people, wherever they go, that is one thing unfortunate, that they take this class color thing with them. As you, I'm sure you've noticed it here, and I'm positive a lot of us have noticed it. The only time Barbadians became black. Trinidadians became black, and we were all black. It was during the race riots of 1958 when I used to live in Martin Hill Gate. Everybody started to identify black, because they knew that was the color that, was, that meant something, not where they came from. And they took that with them, and it, and it takes a long while living away from the narrow confines of these islands to get away from it. You go back now, and a, a thing that you will hear, they, when the slaves came over, in, in, and when they were, you know there were exchange of slaves a lot. Slaves were in the Caribbean. Some, some plantation owners in the south had plantations in Jamaica and vice versa. And there was always an exchange of slaves. For instance, when at crop time, when crop time was over in the Caribbean, they would take some to Georgia, some to North Carolina, and there was this ex exchange. And the slaves that were taken from the Caribbean, if you read, um, ask, well, you, I think you said Aspinall's book, one of the things you notice is they say that the slaves in Georgia respected and admired them because they had such English manners. Can you believe it? And, um, well, and, you know, kind of, and they carried this thing on, you know, gentlemen slave. <laughs> And this is a thing that was carried on a lot, and record was made of it. Even though you go to the Caribbean, and someone, you're sitting on someone's veranda, and um, I say, but John, don't you talk to, to James? No, man, James, James, his mother is nobody. But when he says his mother is nobody, I say, what you mean his mother is nobody? My mother is somebody, his mother's gotta be somebody. You know, I, I didn't go to school with him, I didn't go to school with him, my mother didn't go to school with her. And this carries a whole tradition that we're trying to empty and throw in the sea and in the gutter in the Caribbean. So it does, it does last. And the, at emancipation after that, when they had that fake period called apprenticeship, another form of slavery, when they had that period at the time, and they had indentured labor later on, what happened? The indentured Indians were made to feel better 
Then they said, that was another category of color that I did not bring in a while ago. Because they brought in a, after Africans would not serve on the plantation and would not slaves anymore. Then they got indentured labor from China, some of the seaport areas of China. And indeed, the Chinese naturally would not stay in the land. They went into the towns. They had their laund they became laund laundrymen, grocers, and so on. But they got the Indians from Madras, from Bombay, and from all the bazaars they could find in, in India, the subcontinent. And they brought them there. And straight away, they set about divide. They didn't use them only for labor. They utilized them also as a barrier, as a wedge between African and, and European. So when we, when Africans had to vent their spleen, and they had no jobs, and they were hungry, and their anger, they didn't vent it on the Lord and Master in the big house. They vented it on the Indians. That is why today in the Caribbean, we have, if you, in the big islands of the Caribbean, where that kind of habit predominated, like in Trinidad, and like Guyana, and Jamaica, you have to hear in Trinidad, do a famous phrase you hear, man, you know how them could man thief, the damn thief could man. That's the kind of thing you hear them saying. And you'll hear, you'll hear the, 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 the Indian shopkeeper saying, man, you see this nigga, man, with a man, don't cheap your dog, tell you him, don't rape your dog, tell you know. That is what an Indian is saying about an African brother. And you see, this thing has very deep, deep, deep roots that we are trying to remove, especially as they made the Indians who came as indentured laborers, they made them hold on to the texture and the traditions of their own religion, whereas they disseminated and separated and fragmented African. With the result, if you look at the records, of the society in the Caribbean around the turn of the century. And what you notice is that the jails were full of Africans and Indians, not for, not for having robbed the mass, the, the plantation owner, but for fighting among themselves, for beating and killing and knifing each other. Whereas the real enemy is on top there. That's the man whose house you should set on fire. Amen. Amen. Trinidad, or wherever she goes back, or to Barbados, 
that is a very close and color conscious and class conscious, class ridden place. Forgive me, Jeannie. And when you go there you, and you live here for a while, you realize suddenly how really emancipated the African American woman is in, re in regards to her sister in the Caribbean. The Caribbean was predominantly up to certain times. Again, I'm saying this in a general way, but one can go into, one can, um, can localize it a bit. But there, there, it's a chauvinist society. It has been for a long time a chauvinist society where the male has always predominated. And like the European, the um, Victorian, frustrated, hypocritical woman, that the woman has, uh, uh, the saying is that a woman's best place is the home. The same nonsense and rubbish that whites have been saying. Caribbean men whose social emancipation, I must say, does not happen until they leave the Caribbean and go out of the Caribbean. And so they tend to, no, they tend to admire, but they're not sure, well, this is a new person. Now she's black, she's like this girl from Trinidad or, in, or, 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 or Port of Spain or Jamaica, but yet she's so different. And then, you know, she's emancipated and she knows her work. The Caribbean woman has depended too long on walking uh, slightly behind the Caribbean man. She is now, that's why I have said the role, her role is in the sense that she must herself. It's true that she needs the help of Bella, but emancipate herself. And she's not totally emancipated in the Caribbean. There are still elements lives have nothing to do but pick up the phone on a Sunday, on an afternoon and gossip and then meet each other in the club grounds and sit down and sip tea and pass comments, inane, effect comments about this one's dress, this one's slip is showing, this one's shoe rip it off or something. And they're still going on with this. When there's a big struggle in the wide world going on. And yet they go on with that. So I'm saying that she has, that is why she has a double job. And when the African-American sister comes there, he sees something new. And he, he, respect, he admires it, not that he doesn't respect his own, but his respect is a kind of paternal one, something that is not good enough, something is, that he inherited from Europe. It's all well and good for Europeans to have it, because we can deal with them. But when a black man, an African-Caribbean man has, has it, it's a disgusting shame. And as I said, the boo. Caribbean woman has a, a double role to play to first emancipate herself because she's not only the, there's nothing wrong in procreating and having children because that's one of the roles. But there's more to her than that. And you know, the Caribbean man has not understood that yet and has not respected it. He's got to respect it. And he sees the emancipated sister coming from Harlem or coming from Georgia, where she comes from. And she's, you know, he's after her. I can give you a case in point. In 1972, when I was at Princeton for a while, there was a, she, she, she was a sister at Princeton, Debbie Jackson. She came from Jackson, from, from just opposite New York, Jersey City. And she and a, and a brother, a young student called Carl Barkley, and we, I was going back home, I, was, I owned a people's newspaper at the time. I still, it was still in operation while I was over here teaching at Princeton. And I got her, she came home, went to Dominica with me, a car and herself. And do you know, Debbie had a whale of a time. Sisters there didn't like her, I don't even really imagine. Because everybody, my friend, never stopped going. Everybody was dating, wanting to date Debbie. Debbie, to the son of you, you know the, 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 um, the National Council of Black Lawyers? Well, she works for them. She's a fine, fine sister. And she stayed there a month. And you know, the offers of marriage she got from the best sons in the land are too numerous to mention. But um, I'm saying, Carl himself did his own share with the girls over there, you know. But I'm saying, it is, they are seeing, that is why the brothers in the Caribbean say this. But we have to look to the African-American who is living in the beast of the belly to be able to help us with the struggle, the global struggle that we're involved in. Because his struggle 
Their struggle is our struggle, and it is to them that we have to, to turn, because we understand certain things. We understand the effectiveness, the uselessness of class among black people. And that is one of the things that African Americans teach us when they come to the Caribbean and stay there. The class and color and nothing. Black is Africans, that's what matters. And that's what we learn from them. <laughs> You know, you can't generalize about that, but you take Guyana, what happened? You know, after there was the, you know, the emancipation of the slaves, Guyana was a British place by that time, and slavery was actually abolished on the 1st of August, 1834. But it was not until four years later that it was finally all vestiges of slavery was abolished because they had, excuse me, between that time, 1834 and 1838, they had a system of apprenticeship where you worked certain hours for a nominal pay and the rest of the hours a week that you worked for the plantation owner for nothing. So that went on for four years and eventually that broke off and they got Indian settlers, as you know, Diana has over 52% of the population is Indian, whereas only about 46, 48% is what they call actually in Diana, African. You know that yourself because I can tell you that you, you're from Diana. And so, but the thing is this, that Indians took over a lot of the farming there, and the land fell into the hands of Indians. Africans had some of the big estates. You know what the Africans did? They didn't desert it. When the estates were left, a lot of absentee owners of the plantation left by virtue of debt, drunkenness, gambling, all of that they did, and they borrowed money from the banks and couldn't pay it back. So they just deserted their estates and went to another island where the banks couldn't lay hold of them, on them. Or they all gravitated and migrated to America because America is the land of opportunity and make a hand and so on. And so they went away. Slaves took hold, Africans took hold of the land. And you know how they went on farming? They did not take the land as a big plantation and farm. They broke it up in cooperatives and they were farming it in a communal African way. And most of the land that's owned today in the Caribbean, anywhere in the Caribbean you look to see, those big estates they have in Dominica, those big estates they have in Trinidad, they were broken up in small places. It is still cooperative communal farming they have there. Something that is coming up today and something we learn from our ancestors. They are losing, and many of them, quite true, in some places, a plantation had such a horrible effect, a psychological effect on them, that they ran away as far from the plantation as possible after slavery, after they were emancipated. But in point of fact, I take emancipation just with so much, because many, many, many Africans have already taken their freedom, or have already taken their liberty. Emancipation meant nothing, it's just a change of paper, a treaty, like all British treaties, are British pieces of, pieces of paper that didn't work a light. It didn't mean anything to them. Many, in point of fact, many slaves did not celebrate. They said, what I'm celebrating, I already have my freedom. What am I going to this for? And a good job, too. They just turned their back on emancipation. These British abolitionists were saying they did such a great job, you know, and they were bragging about it in all the history books you read. They didn't, the slaves, the Africans that were here, didn't bother with it. What a lot of them did, a lot of them got as far away from the land as possible and went into the, to the towns, the coastal area. Most of the towns were on the coast. The towns were merely places where the administration of the plantation society took place and where ships pulled into port and ships pulled out taking goods and cattle and sugar and slaves and so on. So they all gravitated there. And what happened from that time onwards is the same thing. Europeans began to move out. They were living in country houses elsewhere. They moved away. 
and it is the how is that the same way the slum areas, the shanty towns of the big cities of Port of Spain and Jamaica all began in that fashion, where Africans crowded themselves with no jobs, with nothing to do. And all the elements of a system that was geared for crime began. And it was there that most of the Africans found themselves, especially as they call you know in the Caribbean, as they call it, the low-class people. We like to use low-class and high-class and upper-class and... Don't let me say the word. And so, brother, that's what happened. Okay. You mean the girls were not converted? No, no. No, you're right. Uh huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. And after the imposition of colonial powers, we begin to accept a doctrine from the bit of a primary to the King James conversion. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Ben heard you. The problem is that having get the doctrine from Rome and England, especially within the Caribbean, we begin to find that, and even in the United States of America, we begin to find that there's a certain amount of passiveness in terms of the economy. Retaining the culture, ingesting the culture, and understanding that it must be carried on through our generation. In the United States, there were two outside of Africa who never fell to the doctrine, the indoctrination of the Christian church, which is then not Christian and not German. So, what we find out there is a dichotomy between the cross and the culture. Yes, uh huh. Yes. Uh huh. What I'm saying, what I'm saying, I'm going to do this. When the African ingests and internalizes the culture, then it becomes revolutionary. Once you, once you have the persuasion of the church on one hand, it is not the capital because they understand that you will still compromise with them. So therefore, I want to know, the poor have to go to the lady to ensure that you listen to the family church and suppress who you are. And the same thing in the Nicaragua. The question I have to ask is this, which is more important, the church or the culture? I don't, um, I'm not prepared to keep it within that category. What's more important is the people, it's the way the people respond. Because if you look, the church never played any hand in any kind of change in the Caribbean, meaningful change I'm talking about. The lives, Africans live their lives come totally devoid of the church. They did not leave the church. In fact, they use the church for their, in, and interpreted the church in their own African way. That is why there were so many retentions. I mean, the church is the, is the one that bent itself to try to inculcate, incorporate and utilize their saints and turn them to utilize our African deities. The church in Haiti, the church in other places. That is why up to today they're trying to do it because the people live their lives in, in spite of the fact that religion plays a part. And I will say this in the Caribbean, the people are the ones, the ones who place much more importance and have always done on the, in the church there are the people, are the educated bourgeoisie. They're the ones that keep to the orthodox, conventional state churches. Churches that have allegiance to the Queen that are having a good time in San Francisco today. The Church of England. A church that was built on sin. On the sin of a man who wanted seven wives because he was too impotent to have a child. 
But that's true. Many of the history books have even been lied to you. A church that is built on that kind of ideology is not fit to be called a church. And blacks, Africans, they are, you know the wisest people you know, in the Caribbean, the African Caribbean people, the ones that cannot read and write yes. the master's yes. English. The church does not bother them. It is those hypocritical, good, God-fearing Catholics and Church of England and Methodists that put on collar and tie and go to church on Sunday morning with their wives and their string of children and are lusting after a young girl sitting in bench five. <laughs> that's who. We are, that's who took the church up. After slavery, after the emancipation, the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel came there and they did nothing. They built schools. The Jesuit priests were in Dominica. They spent 45 years, one priest called Father Raymond Breton, and he lived among the Caribs, and he lived among the Africans, and he tried to convert the people to Roman Catholicism. He succeeded. One child he converted. The child died young. The child died very young. And the mother, the child did not know anything about church, and the mother of the child called Father Bertrand after 45 years there to pray for on her child, as the, the journal says, sooner pray the Lord more. When the child was dead, then that is the one convert who flew on little gilded many wings up there to meet those white heroes up there. One. They didn't succeed. The only thing the church did was to, have a, to set up schools and to educate African Americans, and that was a disaster. The education of African Americans and African Caribbeans should have been left to themselves. They would have done a better job. <laughs> Caribbean. They have every one of them are doubting 
that they're going to get any help. In fact, a lame duck Congress wouldn't even pass anything concrete so that they could get help. They have realized once again that you cannot get the World Bank or world governments, leading governments from countries like this big military power to come and help you. Because they help, they have seen it, they have agreed now that the initiative will not work. And the only thing that will work is they're coming together. They are having a summit meeting at long last among themselves without any outside interference. And I hope they reach an objective because it is about time that all these little islands that are independent, independence is a fine thing, but the sort of class of every little place in the Caribbean independent, it's like a man deliberately breaking himself into little bits, or a person lacerating himself or herself and splitting up in little bits. We have got to join the whole. The Caribbean as a region is a strength. And they are coming to realize that you cannot lift Grenada out of the Caribbean Sea and put it in Russia. It is there forever. You cannot take Cuba away. Cuba belongs to the Caribbean. Whether or not we agree, we have to deal with the politics of the place. That is our own business. It is a family fight, and a family fight that includes not only the Caribbean people, but our brothers and sisters here and in the mainland of Africa. That's how we have to fight it. We need more men like Michael Manley. We need more men like Michael Manley. And Maurice Bishop and others. We need them. That is the kind of men we and women we have in the Caribbean. So that we can break away to we have not broken away from colonialism. You were talking about the church a minute ago. You know what happened? I used to go to the grammar school years and years ago, too many years to try to remember. And there was the same convent I told you about. There was a girl who used to go to the convent. We were very friendly as a family, my father, father, and mother and son. Her name was Avenel. She was a pretty mouse. All of our sisters are pretty anyway. Um, and so she used to go to the convent. And they had the library of the church, the Catholic library was in a place called the St. Gerard's Hall. And the priests and the Catholic church owned there, the cemeteries are there and everything. The bishop's palace and the bishop and heaven and hell and everything is there. <laughs> and um, one day I met her after school. We were going to go to the Botanic Gardens and we were going to go for a walk because, well, I'm going to kiss them, so you know. <laughs> in those, that's all you did. In those days, it's all you did. <laughs> I couldn't get any further. But I'm <laughs> and she met me crying near the St. Gerard's Hall. She had gone for her library book. And the librarian there was one of the Dutch Roman Catholic priests, a young, handsome in the European fashion, you know called Father Van Hava, Van Hava, however you pronounce it. And she was crying her eyes out. I said, I mean, what the heck's wrong? What's wrong with you? She said, if I tell you, you won't believe. And she says, let's go. Come on, I'm going home. So I said, she, on the way home, she told me, Father Van Hava molested her. I said to her, girl, don't tell your mother because your mother's going to beat you. She won't believe you. She said, I don't care. I'm going to tell her. She went home and told her mother that her mother inflicted the beating of her. Her mother fought with her like a woman, two women fighting. And you know, her mother made so many signs of the cross that she should say this about the priest. And he had a reputation of, you know, feeling young girls. That father, they had to send him away. So I'm saying, I know what you're talking about when you talk about the Roman Catholic Church, this kind of thing. I'm not saying everyone is a, is a rotten apple, you know. I'm not saying that that's their own business. That's not for me to sort out. That's their own problems. And again, we, are, we have young men and women like you now in the Caribbean who realize the futility. And they're pressuring these governments. They're pressuring their own governments to drop this farce about Caribbean-based initiative. Reagan is not interested in the Caribbean. He's not interested in Africa. He's only going to exploit Africa, exploit the Caribbean.